Hey guys, uh, my name's Michelle. And I'm Laura. Hannah. We're housemates. Um, and we just had two things that um, we wanted to share with you guys today. Um, we've just been um, increasingly becoming aware of a, a need that we see in Flagstaff. Um, there is currently a shortage of shelter spaces for the homeless members in our, in our community that are, that are a part of our community. Um, and um, just the other day we were having breakfast with um, someone we know that works at one of the shelters and he was saying that um, as many as 10 people are being turned away just from this one shelter um, during weather like we're having today. Um, so, um, yeah, and a couple of nights ago, uh, oh, and just to preface the story, I do homeless outreach for work, and a couple of nights ago, um, we found this young woman in the woods just outside of Flag Flagstaff um, just two nights ago, and it was just when this weather was getting bad um, that we're having this weekend, and she just had a pile of blankets and a sleeping bag for the evening to get through the night. Um, and I was just talking with her, and she was saying that she's, you know, hoping to head out of Flagstaff in a couple of weeks. And so that prompted me to ask her, um, you know, are you heading towards someone, someone that you know? Um, just a question that um, naturally came forth from what she had told me. And um, she just said that, you know, I don't know anyone just really flatly, matter of factly, I don't know anyone. Um, there was literally, she felt no one that she knew, <laughs> um, which really hit me hard. And um, yeah, so we just um, have become increasingly aware of this need. And so us girls have kind of been talking and dreaming together um, for the past month, a lot of nights throughout this past month at our house in our living room, just around our fire stove, um, just really dreaming of what God might have us do, just sitting around sipping chais and making way too many s'mores. Um, yeah, so Lori's gonna talk a little bit about um, what that vision um, might look like. So, like she said, we've been dreaming a lot and dreaming really big, and so I'm gonna kinda narrow it down to what we've decided is something we can feasibly start with right now, and um, our vision is really to bring together the church buildings and the church bodies and flag staff, and, um, unite them in a way that we can have overflow into these church buildings. So the church buildings that sit empty at night, um, setting up some sort of a system so that we can um, get together some cots and some sleeping bags and maybe some portable showers, whatever that looks like, um, and figure out how to get these people housed that are being over overflowed out of these other shelters. So, but it's it's more than a service for us. We don't we don't want to create something that's just going to get used up and, and they're, they're not getting anything else out of it. We do want to give them some place to stay, but it's more than that. We want them to have a chance at relationships. Um, and our church definitely really believes in the power of relationships. And so one of the things we've talked about is, is bringing together people who are going to be willing to invest in these individuals who are staying the night. And that might be a short-term relationship, but one of the things we're also dreaming of is, is something that we can build so it's long-term relationships. Um, so we're, we're looking to build this system and we need to get a vision team together and hands can talk about that. Yeah, um, so like we were saying, we, we want to start like a vision team um, for this. This is our passion and we know that other people share this passion too. Um, and we want you guys to be involved. Um, this is a community and we want, um, maybe like homeless outreach isn't your passion. Maybe you want to walk down that road and see if it is your passion. Um, maybe you're really good at organizing things or construction or calling people. We need all sorts of people to make this happen. Um, and we want you guys in this with us. Um, so we are going to have a sign up sheet um, out back or in the foyer um, afterward. Just come sign up. We're going to have like a, um, well, I would say carry in, but I guess you guys call it a potluck um, at our house uh, February uh, the 19th, which is a Tuesday. Um, just to kind of go over, see what everyone else's dreams are, and kind of come together and just dream big. So, yeah, come visit us. Oh, and side note uh, really exciting. Uh, us three girls, we're going to start a um, women's community group. It's going to start next Friday, which is the 15th, at our place. We're just going to come hang out, um, meet people. Um, yeah, so please join us. You can find us out back, too, if you need us get your information. But.
creepy guys thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we're going to do something else. We're going to start a tradition. Um, since they are starting a community group, we wanted everybody to know about it. And we're also going to pray for them. So I want to pray for their community group and uh, the vision that they're talking about. So let's pray. God, thank you so much um, for these ladies. God, thank you so much for their um, passion for those less fortunate than them. And uh, God, thank you that they're willing to act on that and take a risk and pray you bless that. And we also pray, God, celebrating, um, God, that they want to go deeper in community and open up their home and their relationships um, in a community group. We ask you to bless that. Just bless them and fill them with joy. And thank you for the great example that they are. In Jesus' name, amen. I was kind of wondering, Hannah, if you're from England or something, where do you say weird stuff like a carrion? Midwestern? I think it's potlucks there, too. <laughs> like a, not a linguistic specialist. Man. Sounds shady to me. All right, hey, we're also going to pray for another church in town. That's our tradition. In fact, one of the things I love about their vision, I was just listening back there, is it's kind of exciting to me. When we started meeting together in, in our home before the commons ever existed, some of the dreams that we have for our community is that we would be a church, a group of people that came together that didn't have kind of this top-down philosophy where there was a staff that made all these decisions and dreamed up these programs and then implemented them in the people. We instead were hoping for a community of people that felt moved by God and would feel empowered to do it. And that's exactly what's happened. They come here, they're excited, they have a passion. We want to get behind it. What I really love about their vision is it has almost nothing to do with the commons except only relationally who we are. It's really about the greater church. It's about all churches coming together to serve the poor. And it's really cool. I didn't plan all this, but what we're going to talk about today is going to line up a lot with what they were just sharing about. So let me pray for another church in town, as we always do. I want to pray for my friend Jackie Holgate. He's the pastor over at Mountaintop Assembly. Um, that is a 95% Navajo congregation, and he is an amazing good friend. So let's pray for them. God, thank you uh, for the gift of friendship uh, that I have with um, Jackie. Thank you for his heart uh, to bring your name glory, to share your love not only here, but around all the native peoples, God. Thank you for his giftedness, his passion for you, um, his wonderful family, his wife and children. We just ask you to bless them and, and to bless their body, God. Um, our brothers and sisters um, who meet over there, who we love dearly, I just pray that they will be filled with you, uh, learn of you, be filled with joy, and that you bless them with your presence. We love them, and we also pray for our time together today that you bless it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, thank you for being here. It was really beautiful just even 20, 30 minutes ago watching the sheets of snow coming down outside. You guys are, uh, you get stars or something for coming to church in such weather. So thank you, You're to, to your credit. I was thinking of the um, Job 38, because I'm a pastor and I constantly think of scripture. It's just, it just overflows out of me. But, uh, so get used to that. But in Job 38, it's, it's wonderful poetry. I don't know if you were here, but uh, I think it was last summer we actually went through Job. We kind of kind of went through the summary of this great poet, really, that lived 3,500 years ago, probably, which is mind-bending to me. But I love in Job 38, and I just want you to read it later, where God is talking to Job, this, this whole idea of the problem of pain and evil has come up, and God's basically giving some perspective through this poetry, and he's asking Job, have you ever entered the storehouses of the snow? Or have you entered the armory of the hail? And he talks about all sorts of things. Have you ever commanded the morning dawn and asked the sun to come up in the morning? Kind of just this really great moment where God's just saying, do you really have the same perspective that I have? And I just thought that's cool as I think about the snow coming down. And I would encourage you to go read that poetry later as we're, we're in a series, a discussion about Dead Poet Society. I think Job was one of the greatest. Now, I also want to make on a side note, tangent there, that that was not science. I don't think Job or God or anyone was communicating that the real science behind snow is that it's stored up in a storehouse somewhere. It's metaphor, it's poetry, it's beauty. It helps us realize who God is and, and his perspective. And I, and I think that's pretty, pretty amazing. Now, I wanted to give you guys, before we went into a message today, um, a little nugget that's probably going to be more valuable than anything else that I share today. You may not know this, guys especially, but, but Valentine's Day is sneaking up. You know this, right? It's this week. And I have this um, adopted brother in Amarillo, and he shared something on social media this week that I wanted to share with you guys. But he basically said, if you're a guy and you have a Valentine Day, or you have a Valentine, sorry if you don't, uh, but if you do, and you don't know what to do, you can tell your wife or your significant other, you can say, you know what, I have got you a huge surprise Valentine. And you're welcome to guess at what that is. And then you just write down as she gives you a shopping list <laughs> of what you can get her for Valentine's Day. 
Yeah, take that to the bank. Because <laughs> it changed my life forever. Mark is not in here, I don't think. Oh, she is. That just got awkward. <laughs> I, I really do have you a surprise. No, I don't. Uh, so I wanted to share the, uh, also before we dove in, I wanted to share the arbitrary story of my children um, from, from this last week. I just thought this was really cute. I was driving with Sierra in the car the other day, and, and she was saying to me, she's saying, Dad, um, she goes, I, I want to get really long. And uh, I was like, gosh, I don't really know what that means, babe. She's like, you know, like Aspen's really long. I want to be long like Aspen. And I said, oh, you mean tall. She said, yeah, yeah, really long like Aspen. I said, oh, okay. And she said, I think I am going to get long or tall like Aspen. I said, good. How much? She goes, well, because I'm glowing. I said, like, what? She goes, I'm glowing. She said, I learned that every day I'm glowing. I'm glowing bigger and bigger. Yeah. And I just thought, oh my gosh. You have no idea how much you are glowing. Right now. <laughs> um, but I'm fascinated with language and, and misinterpretations. And then another thing happened with our kids. We were having dinner the other night. And one of the things we do as a family is um, at dinner time, we like to share highs and lows. And I have four kids, they range from seven down to one. And it's kind of interesting because a six and a seven year old, you can actually have a pretty good conversation about your highs and lows of the day. And so every day we do this at dinner and they, they share what they really liked about the day, but we always tell them to go worse first. You know, tell your worst part first and then we'll end on a positive note. So they go around and Aspen always share something a little longer, more dramatic on both sides. It's just her in a nutshell. And then Cole, almost every day, he's so cute. He's always like, there's nothing, nothing bad today, but the good stuff was he can almost never think of something negative, which I love. Um, and then Sierra goes, and it's always hard to understand her. She's three years old, but she gets excited, and she basically always has phrases from what Aspen and Colt said mixed in there, but we're never really sure if she's talking about a positive or a negative. But we always also ask Blaze, you know, just because he's not left out. And Blaze doesn't talk much other than <laughs> it's like his noise. And so every, every time we ask Blaze, we say, hey, Blaze, what was your highs and lows? And he'll say, uh, uh, uh. And uh, he's like talking with his hands, so I think he's really saying something. But... So this happened the other night, and Cole kind of got upset and kind of interrupted Blaze. And he's like, Blaze, he's like, you're supposed to start with your worst first. <laughs> what? Is it like some kid language that I don't, I don't understand? Well, so here's what I realized. I, uh, we, had, we had a parents' night out on Friday night. And I don't understand what kind of crack you smoke if you're a parent and you don't take us up on it. It's the coolest thing our church does. It's free babysitting, go out for a date. So I went out on a date and I was with Brian, Tinder, and Shay. We had a really good time. And it was funny because I was telling these stories and, and Brian's kind of a stay-at-home dad like me. I'm four days out of the week, I'm a stay-at-home dad because my wife is brilliant and working on crazy school stuff. And um, We're walking along outside in the snow and we're kind of laughing because we realize that we're, we're like the moms. All we can talk about is stories of our kids. And our wives are behind us talking about world problems and their careers. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, what's happened to us? Um, and that's, that's the only segue I have to what we're going to talk about today, because I'm Mr. Mom. Today, we're going to continue into our Dead Poet Society series, which I'll refresh you on in just a second. And we're going to talk about one of the most famous mothers of all time, who was not a mother, Mother Teresa. And I'm excited about talking about Mother Teresa for a lot of reasons. Now, if you haven't been with us or you don't know what we're talking about, this particular discussion this Dead Poets Society is a resurrected discussion that we had a couple years ago where we take the, a look at somebody in the great and broad discussion of church history, somebody who's followed Christ that we think would have a message for us. In fact, it comes from the movie Dead Poets Society in the scene where Robin Williams takes his students out into a lobby and from this old school, he, he whispers the voices from the boys in the past that echo through time to give them a message I and mean, that's kind of the idea. We want to treasure those that have gone before us and have something to share with us. So, a little bit of background of Mother Teresa. Now, she's kind of a controversial figure. Not much. She's also probably one of the most popular people in the world. She's not without her critics, which I would say makes her human. She wasn't perfect. She's not Jesus. Um, but she was somebody who loved Jesus dearly. She was born in Skopje. Um, which is in modern-day Macedonia. I've actually been to Skopje. It's a pretty uninteresting city. Now, when she was born in 1910, it was the Ottoman Empire. It wasn't Macedonia. And she grew up in a non-religious home until she was nine years old and her dad died. Her dad was, uh, they are Albanian. That's their uh, ethnicity. And he was very much into Albanian politics. And he died when she was nine years old. And at nine years old, her mother made a decision that she was going to raise her daughter to be Roman Catholic. Now, some scholars, it's a little sketchy to know exactly what the issue was, say that at this time, from nine to 12 years old, she became 
really enthralled by stories from missionaries in the Catholic Church, especially ones in Bengal in India, and their different stories. In fact, by the time she was 12, she tells us later in life, she knew that her call was to serve as a full-time missionary. So she did that. She grew up and she became um, a, a Catholic nun and she went to a convent. Uh, and I wanted to share with you a quote about her ethnicity and who she was, because I think this is a really important framework uh, to looking at who she was. But here's, here's what she says. By blood, I'm an Albanian. By citizenship, an Indian. She lived most of her life in India. By faith, I'm a Catholic nun. And as to my calling, I belong to the world. And as to my heart, I belong entirely to the heart of Jesus. I wanted to start there because I think it gives a really good framework as to why we would look at someone like her. Now, as you'll find, or you probably already know, she had an immense impact on this world. And ultimately, where we're going today is going to be look specifically at what that is. But the great thing is, at her very core, her heart belonged to Jesus. She was passionately in love with Jesus. And as you'll see, her life was shaped in every way to figure out how she could look more and more like the actual Jesus. So she went off to, to be a nun. In fact, she went to Ireland uh, to a convent to study English because what she had heard was that in India, the, one of the most important functions of a nun was to teach English to these um, Bengali children. And so she did that. She studied English. She learned it. It wasn't her native language. And then she went and taught English for about 20 years. No, that's not right. About 15 years. And the main change in her life, uh, she was very servant-based. She loved Jesus. She was very, uh, in fact, she rose prominently within her own comment to be the, the headmistress of a certain one. She was very influential. But at around 35, uh, she took a train ride that changed her life forever. Uh, she was riding from the Himalaya Mountains, where she did most of her ministry, to Calcutta in India. And she had been overwhelmed with the political disaster of the mid-40s when this took place and what had happened to Calcutta. Extreme poverty, not, not poverty like we know, but unbelievable, unbelievable poverty had taken over this Indian city, which has happened numerous times in that country for a long time. And she was overwhelmed by the hurting and the broken. It was on that train ride that she said she realized her call within her call. She already knew her whole life she was called to love Jesus. But by the time that train ride stopped, she had decided that if she did not leave her convent and go live amongst the poor with them, what he, she called the poorest of the poor, she would be denying her faith. Now, she didn't know this at the time, but historians would say that it was on this train ride that she became Mother Teresa. Because she began what would be the next five decades of living a life that would seem very strange and foreign to us. For five decades before she died in 1997, she truly lived with the poorest of poor. In fact, I can't imagine the numbers of stories that she would have. She started orphanages. She started places for lepers. She started AIDS and HIV. She started hospices. She did everything in her power to love the most hurting people in the world. And here's why because she believed that Jesus would have done the same thing. Now, I want to give you a little nugget here before we go any further. If you think today's message, as we look at Mother Teresa, is just a call for all of us to leave our life and go to India, it is not. It may be that. It may be that someone in here needs to do that. I wouldn't want to soften the blow if that's truly the call that you have within a call in your own life. But we're going to see that Mother Teresa had a lot to say, not only to what she began, what are called the, the missionaries of charity, her nuns that changed the world. In fact, in 2012, 15 years after she died, there were about 4,500 nuns, sisters of the missions of charity in 133 countries and about 600 brothers who live and serve in orphanages and hospices. She has certainly made an impact on the hurting in this world. Her life was certainly significant. But here's the question. What would she teach us? Because that's kind of the whole context of this discussion. If we find someone who has a life worth emulating, or we see someone whose writings or ideas or something that could pass on or her voice could echo through time, what would it be that Mother Teresa would share with us? Now, we could read her own writings for that, but I wanted to take a look at a scripture from Luke chapter 4. Should I pull it up? I'm gonna, I forgot my Bible, which I don't know what that means if the pastor forgets his Bible. Um, so I'm going to have to use this technology. I hope it works. Kind okay, of scroll down. We're going to look at Luke 4, verse 14. Now, here's what's going on. You'll see, it'll be obvious to you why I think Mother Teresa might be passionate about sharing this particular passage from Luke, the historian. Now, Luke has just shared with us earlier in Luke 4 the great story of the temptation of Jesus in the desert. 
And it's really interesting because he comes out of this temptation period, which, by the way, there's great writing and thinking about how beautiful this time with Jesus and his temptation and his humanity and his divinity was the beginning and launching point of his ministry. And in Luke 4.14, where we're going to start, we're going to see is where his actual ministry began, according to Luke. Now, it's interesting to point out, though, that Mark, you know, in the very similar passage in Mark 6, tells the story happening later. Most scholars believe that Luke actually moved this story to the beginning because he wanted to make a point about what Jesus' ministry was about. In fact, there's even intrinsic clues in this that Jesus had already had a ministry in Capernaum by the Sea of Galilee. And this is going to take place in his hometown of Nazareth. But Luke thought it very important to begin and frame Jesus' whole ministry with this story. So here it is. This is Luke 4, verse 14. Then Jesus, in the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and news about him spread throughout the surrounding countryside. It says he began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by all. This is yet another of literally dozens of paragraphs that I always stop to mention that there was something about Jesus that was incredibly attractive. Something about his personality or his charisma. He had the ability in the way he communicated to draw people to himself. And that's including the fact that he said some of the most shocking and repulsive things to the audience that was around him. People still wanted to hear what he had to say next. So we see that here. He's praised by all. He's gaining ground at the beginning of his ministry. And here's what happens in his hometown of Nazareth. It says, Now Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. Let me stop right here. Now, we're back in Nazareth. You, most of you probably know that Jesus was the, um, raised by a carpenter and, and Mary in the town of Nazareth. And I was very fortunate a couple summers ago to go to this place and see Nazareth. It's actually a beautiful hillside, a very tree. I was surprised it wasn't as deserty as I thought. It was a, a beautiful place. And they actually even recreated in Nazareth what first century Palestine and what Nazareth would have looked like, which is really great for some context of the life of Jesus growing up. But we have in the story here that he enters the synagogue and he stands up to read. Now, a little note about what this looks like. It was neat. I got to go into one of these synagogues. And it's kind of a, like a long rectangular building. And there's block stairs that go up the side on three sides. There's an entryway and then block stairs that go all the way around, almost creating like a, a horseshoe amphitheater. And a synagogue is something that developed in the intertestamental period. In other words, between the end of Malachi and the writing of Matthew is about 400 years of Jewish history between the Old and New Testament. And in that time, the Jewish people developed this cultural thing to build these synagogues, a place of learning. Now, it was, as we've mentioned many times, a very patriarchal society. In fact, the, the only rules that Jewish people have for a synagogue in a small town like Nazareth is you have to have 10 men. They didn't really care about women. You had to have 10 men that would come together. They would read the Hebrew scriptures and they would discuss them. There was also a structure of leadership in place. Now, it, it was a great thing. In fact, the Mishnah, in other words, writings that interpret the Jewish things, tell us a lot about the philosophy of the synagogues of the day. And Jesus, his life was interjected right into the middle of this culture. As a Jewish man returned to his hometown, he was attractive enough as a personality that people wanted to hear what he had to say about the scriptures. So that's what's happening. He stands up in the synagogue and he says, and this, it says, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him and he unfolded the scroll. Um, he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. And he's quoting Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And I think you'll hear why Mother Teresa would like this. Because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to pro proclaim release to the captives and the regaining of sight to the blind. To set free those who are oppressed. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He reads from a scroll. It was really cool. When I was in the synagogue there, they, they had an old papyrus scroll sitting there. So you could actually picture somebody unrolling this piece of Isaiah and standing up and reading this with this kind of crowded room of, of men, mostly. And he would read this very uh, messianic prophecy. This was about the Messiah, the, the arm of the Lord that was to rescue humanity. And everyone knew that. And Jesus reads it. And I love what it says next. It says, then he rolled up the scroll. He gave it back to the attendant and he sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him. Those two sentences, to me, sound like a, a scene from a movie. You know, he's just saying, like, I just killed that. Handed the sin, it goes and sits down, and everyone is staring at him. But here is what I love. He doesn't just sit in silence. Everyone is shocked that he read this Messiah verse when he's gaining so much 
person, he's getting so much of a following at the very beginning of his ministry. He reads a thing about the Messiah, but then listen to what he says. Then he began to tell them, and this is, would have been shocking to their ears. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled, even as you heard it being read. I mean, he's saying, that verse that I just read, that's about me. I am the one sent to set the captives free, to be good news. The Greek word is evangelism, where we get the word evangelism, to the poor. It's good news for the poor. My life and what I'm ushering in. And I'll give you another little neat, interesting nugget. When it says the year of the Lord in English, when that's translated in Latin, in the, in the early church, they would write all these Lukes and all the Gospels in Latin. The phrase is Anno Domino, which means in the year of our Lord, which you're probably familiar with because it's abbreviated A.D. Because we measure time from the moment this human entered our planet. Because as he said at that day, as I was reading the scroll, it's being fulfilled right now. Time changed forever. Everything went from before Christ to Anno Domino in the year of our Lord. A new kingdom. A Messiah who's bringing good news to the poor. And it's interesting how fast things change right after this. He says, all were speaking well of him. Again, they're attracted to his, I guess his audacity to say these things. And they were amazed at the gracious words coming out of his mouth. And then they said, and it's interesting, in the Greek it actually says, and then, as if something changed, isn't this Joseph's son? So in the minute of getting wrapped up in the authority that he was speaking with, in fact, many different times when Jesus was speaking, we find that the, the people were amazed at the authority he spoke with because he claimed to have divine authority, that he himself was God. And that wasn't missed on the audience members. But here in his hometown, in the little town of Nazareth, after gaining so much momentum, and as they were actually being drawn in, somebody begged the question, wait, 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 isn't this just Joseph's son? Don't we know Joseph, the carpenter? And listen to how Jesus reacts as they've basically turned on him as they realize he's just one of the local boys. Jesus said to them, no doubt you will quote to me the proverb, physician, heal yourself, and it's funny, from extra-biblical sources, we find this proverb. And this proverb in the Greek and Jewish people of the day was basically the equivalent of saying, prove it. So he's saying, I know you guys are probably wanting me to prove it. And he goes on to say, and say, what we have heard that you did in Capernaum, do here in your hometown too. And he added, I tell you the truth, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. And then he goes on in the next couple of verses to describe how Elijah and Elisha both were rejected by the people who knew them the closest, but they went and did great miracles and had great ministry among people who weren't so familiar with him. I'll skip down to the very end of that part. It says that they got up and they forced him out of town. It's amazing how quickly the atmosphere changed. And they brought him to the brow of the hill in which the town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. And it's funny, I actually stood where I would think some of this could have happened in Nazareth. This is one of the many Jason Bourne type moments in Jesus' life. He's chased the edge of the cliff and it says, but he passed through the crowd and went on his way. I assume there's some miraculous or supernatural element to this. I, I, I don't know if he's just crafty or sly, but whatever it was, the people had turned on Jesus. Now I wanna make one point that I think is a little bit irrelevant to Mother Teresa and then I wanna come back to what I think she would teach to us. The first thing that I think Luke wanted to communicate in this story, in this drastic turning of events as Jesus was proclaiming who he was and that ultimately his mission as bringing in the kingdom of God was to make a difference in the lives of the poorest of the poor like Mother Teresa. The most interesting thing to me is as his local town turns on him, it begs the question for me, were they too familiar with Jesus? Because I think that question is easily thrown into this room if you've been a follower of Christ for any amount of time. Are we too familiar with Jesus? I've had the great privilege in my life to walk through and, and see in my own journey with Christ and many friends, those who have hated God, had no belief in God, to move to faith in Christ and meet Jesus for the first time, as many of you have. And I'm always amazed at those who are unfamiliar with Christ how passionately in love they are with who he is when they find out the truth about who he is. And I'm also amazed in my own life how comfortable and familiar I get with Jesus, how unamazed I become at the miracle of God entering into our planet, entering into my own story or entering into your story. So I think Luke, at the beginning of all this, 
when he wrote this down, wanted us to be challenged with that thought, are we too familiar with Jesus? I think Mother Teresa probably would have derailed and focused on this part about bringing good news to the poor. And there's a few questions, the great so what? Why does this passage in particular, what would Mother Teresa maybe be able to voice to us today to think about this? And the first one is, probably the most simple, on the lowest level of application, how well do you do at taking care of the poor? Because we can't pretend for a second that the poor are only in Calcutta. They are in this town. And that's why I think it's beautiful, perfect God timing that these girls shared their heart today. That was not planned at all. I didn't even know I was talking about Mother Teresa until a few hours ago. I love that they have a passion for the absolute poor in Flagstaff. And I believe that is because they are in love with the heart of Jesus, just like Mother Teresa was. So on the very simplest level, I think it's important for us to wrestle with the question of how well do we love the poor. Now we have a few things that we do as this church, and the best thing to do is get it plugged into a community group because at our community group level, we have community groups that are serving at the Northern Arizona Food Bank and at Hope Cottage, and we're doing a food drive to help the poor. Those are little tangible things that we can all do. We can all go deeper in that way. But here's what I want you to hear, which I think is unique, that I think Mother Teresa would share about us living in America with this question. Here's a quote. She was... Uh, she, was, she got the Nobel Peace Prize in 1979. This actually isn't the quote. One of the things they asked, this is a total side note, and I love this. They said, at the, when she received the Nobel Peace Prize, they said, how do you want to usher peace into the world? And she said, it's very simple. Go home and love your families. And I thought that's just such a profound truth that she understood that most of the discord and unhealth of the world comes from people who don't have healthy love in their home. And then she took the $192,000 that was given to her and gave it to the poor completely. And then they started to ask her all about the poor. They started to ask her different things about what she's experienced. And then this is a quote she said that I think is most relevant to us. She says, around the world, not only in the poor countries, but I found the poverty of the West so much more difficult to remove. When I pick up a person from the street hungry, I give them a plate of rice, a piece of bread, and I am satisfied. I've removed that hunger, but a person that's shut out, that feels unwanted and unloved, terrified, the person that's been thrown out from society, that poverty is so hurtable and so much that I find it very difficult. Mother Teresa, living five decades, watching people die of horrible diseases, loving the poor, the poor, giving the food, changing the world, literally recognized that some of the poorest people live in the United States of America. And some of them have huge bank accounts. And so there's a couple questions that come out of that for me. One, how do we love people as a community that are outsiders, not necessarily because of their socioeconomic stance, but because of their relational and social stances? The unlovable, the untouchable, the sinners, the people that Jesus was very passionate about. If we have the same love of the heart of Jesus, that we would also be drawn to loving the poor in spirit, as two of the gospel writers say, not just the poor, those that are absolutely broken. Now here's the last question I want to ask you. Is it possible that you are the poor? One of the things that I love so much about this community is that we all have very different stories. And there may be very few, there may be, there may be very many of you in this room who are spiritually poor. You're in no position whatsoever to think about how to love the physically poor or the spiritual poor because you yourself are so broken. Maybe you have not even initially found and discovered the unconditional and unbreakable love of God. Maybe you have begun to discover that God loves you, but you can't believe in your heart of hearts that you are loved and accepted. And so for you, I would offer the hope of communion that we share always together. That the message that Mother Teresa fell in love with, the reason she followed so faithfully her Catholic faith, is the blood of Jesus that was poured out, not just to make a social difference in the world, but to make a difference in our human hearts. That by dying and suffering in our place, we might have a way to be put back in a perfect relationship with our loving God. So as all we always do, we're going to share in communion as they come and sing a song. Um, if you haven't been here before, we have four different stations where we remember the body and the blood of Christ. If you're a follower of Christ, anyone is welcome to join and remember Him in that way. And as we do, 
wrestle with the, those questions. How well do we love the poor physically? How do we love the poor that are broken? And, and what are we ourselves? How rich are we in the love of Christ? Let me pray for us. God, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm just so thankful for the, I guess, 5,100 brothers and sisters that still love the poor in the mission, missionaries for charity, God. Um, the difference that one woman made by giving her life completely to your heart. And we ask you to bless those missions as they continue in 133 countries. And God, I thank you that Mother Teresa did all of that only because you first loved her. She knew that being close to your heart, Jesus, was the hope that she had. And so at this time of communion, Lord, I pray that this will be something we do together, but also very alone with just you, God, in this place. Separate everything out and help us to realize and hear your voice, how much you love us with your body broken, your blood spilled for us, which means the forgiveness of our sins. <coughs> and we desperately need forgiveness, Father. Clean our hearts. We love you. And thank you for this time.